Welcome to RCR Wireless News. I'm Martha DeGrasse, and I'm here today with Yossi Cohen. He is co-founder of Magnacom, and Magnacom is getting ready to introduce a new 5G technology. Yossi, thanks for joining us today. I know that you have a history with both Broadcom and Motorola Mobility, so if you want, could you start off by telling us a little bit about what drew you to this technology at this time and what you hope to accomplish here? Yes, thank you, Marta. Um, I joined Motorola Mobility at the very end of uh, 2010 and uh, spent approximately 18 months at the company uh, as a senior vice president managing one of the business units of the company until the, uh, the Google acquisition, which happened in the middle of 2012. So uh, following that, I took some time to uh, uh, rest and recover and travel and uh, happened to uh, meet my, uh, my partner, uh, Amir Elias, who invented this uh, very exciting technology, uh, he told me about it and uh, explained what uh, what the potential is and what it could do uh, for the world. And I was immediately drawn to it and uh, spent a few hours with him to try to understand it as best I could. And I have to admit that I was uh, initially very skeptical that uh, that you could get such a quantum improvement compared to uh, everything and anything that you know out there today in digital communication. Um, you know, quant, uh, quant modulation is really in the heart of all modems today, um, really on all wired and wireless modem for all modern communication. So whether it's in, uh, you know, cellular is, is using QAM 128 today and uh, going to QAM 256 likely um, in next generation. Wi-Fi is already at QAM 256 and you have things like much more even advanced and higher performance wireless uh, networks in wireless backhaul, for example, that are already at QAM 1000. And um, as it turned out, the general belief, I think, in the industry is this, uh, quote unquote, this lemon has been squeezed for, you know, every drop that's in it because you've had millions of engineers work for dozens of years in trying to improve and, and get any dB improvement um, of it. And again, both all wired and wireless communication. So when uh, Amir Elias, my partner and co-founder of, uh, uh, of Magnacom, uh, showed me the, uh, the technology that he invented and, uh, and explained that you could get up to 10 dB improvement, it was really unbelievable. Um, so I spent about two months of uh, going uh, in multiple cycles of due diligence with people that I consider you know, experts in the industry and really understand uh, the, the very deep mathematics behind it and so forth. And when I was convinced that uh, uh, that uh, this technology indeed is, is so groundbreaking, we founded the company at the end of 2012. So, uh, you know, today uh, we're finally coming out of a so-called stealth mode and telling the world about our existence and about our technology and what it's about and where it can be used and so forth. And uh, we chose this timing uh, to be very close to uh, the CES show, the Consumer Electronics uh, Show in Las Vegas at the beginning of January. And the reason for that is we will be demonstrating live uh, the capability of our technology and we'll show people it actually working and, and they'll be able to see this, this 10 dB improvement compared to the highest performance, best in class QAM based solution today. So uh, with that we feel that we will be able to uh, hopefully overcome a lot of uh, natural skepticism that, uh, that I think people will, uh, will have when they see our announcement tomorrow. Okay, great. And WAM is the name. Can you tell us what WAM stands for? Yeah, it's uh, it's actually a non-descriptive name. It's uh, but it stands for wave modulation, um, and it's it's really a different modulation technique com compared to QAM, which is the quadrature amplitude modulation being used today across uh, the entire infrastructure of uh, of telecommunications in the world. Again, both wired and wireless. Now, I know that you're coming out of, of stealth mode. Have you been talking to, to any of the mobile operators yet or not yet? We haven't had conversations with, uh, with operators directly. We've had uh, a number of conversations with various, um, I want to call it premier players in the industry that uh, uh, were all under uh, you know, confidentiality agreements. Uh, we've gotten very positive response that is almost always mixed with a level of skepticism and a desire to uh, to see the technology, you know, in real hardware, which is what we're going to be able to deliver very soon. So yeah, let's let's talk about the hardware just a little bit. Um, first of all, the, the footprint. How how much um, silicon are we talking about? 
So we've uh, we've done some estimates um, in terms of uh, you know what the cost would be or what the impact would be on uh, devices to incorporate this technology. I have a very uh, uh, deep uh, semiconductor background. I, I spent many years at premier companies like uh, uh, Broadcom, for example, which which I'm very proud of. And um, so you know, again, it's it's really an estimate because you know it depends on process geometry and other factors, but. Um, we believe the implementation of the technology in the, you know modern silicon design is in the neighborhood of one millimeter square, so it's clearly non-prohibitive, um, uh, you know, for uh, uh, for companies to uh, uh, to incorporate one millimeter square of cost, especially considering the very significant benefits that uh, that it delivers. Uh, what we will show uh, at CES or in Las Vegas. Is, uh, is what is called an FPGA uh, implementation of it based on Altera. Altera is the, the world leader in, uh, in FPGA technology and, and devices and we've partnered with them earlier this year and we developed a demonstration vehicle which enabled us to do this so quickly and obviously uh, at, uh, at you know very good cost. So at CES we will show people it actually works on an FPGA implementation and we think some of our potential customers may choose to, uh, especially if they use Altera FPGAs, they could uh, use to take something very similar to what we already have or we'll be showing at CES and incorporate it into their designs very quickly. So you see see other chip makers as other potential customers? Yes, so we see uh, chip makers as potential customers, uh, we see system makers as uh, potential customers, um, and um, uh, we think, uh, you know, operators would have interest in it. Uh, we think it's uh, it's something that is uh, it, it should be interesting and attractive to people across uh, you know various uh, market segments. Again, being both wired and wireless in uh, some segments of the DSL market, some segments of the uh, uh, cable market. I, I wouldn't expect it to be um, attractive all the way up to uh, uh, the user side, but in the uh, you know more. Uh, uh, call it uh, central office type uh, type applications and stuff like that in both DSL and cable. I think there could be applications that would be uh, interesting for them. I think in satellite applications this could be very interesting um, as well as in uh, wireless backhaul applications for example. Can, yes, before we finish, can you just talk a little bit about how you see this working with existing network infrastructure? Yes, so I think uh, for uh, for our company to be successful and for this technology to be um, of interest to our potential customers, I believe there are three critical prerequisites. One um, is that it really must be a meaningful improvement compared to what they have today. I think that if I came in and said, hey, implement this new uh, modulation technique and get, you know, 5%, 10%, maybe even 20% improvement, um, it, it really would be a very difficult sort of an uphill battle. Um, and, and that's why, again, if I, had, if I had shown one or two dBs improvement, that, that would be the kind of reaction I would get. So I think the first prerequisite is it has to be very meaningful, and clearly a 10 dB um, improvement is what we call game-changing and, and very, very meaningful. It's a quantum uh, leap compared to what, uh, what exists out there today. The second is that um, we think it must be um, very uh, cost-effective and not prohibitive from a cost perspective. So we think implementing it in a pure digital design in a one square millimeter of, uh, of silicon or around one square millimeter of silicon is clearly not cost prohibitive for the majority if not all of the segments that we intend uh, to promote this technology to. Um, and um, this, uh, this cost impact is, uh, is really for the full, uh, you know, one four thousand ninety six, uh, like the highest uh, performing uh, uh, modem out there today. If you're implementing it in smaller, uh, uh, lower level uh, modems, you would actually see less than that. The third one, which uh, which I believe is the third prerequisite, is that it must be backwards compatible with the entire infrastructure of perhaps seven plus billion connected devices out there today, which are all based on QAM. So um, a, a key capability of uh, or uh, attribute of, uh, of WAM modulation is that it interfaces to the system or integrates into the system exactly the same way as QAM does today. So uh, it enables the, the designers to implement the solution or implement the system in a way that is 100% backwards compatible, completely interoperable with all the 7 plus billion connected devices out there today. Think of it as... Uh, if you have a 4G phone and uh, 
you know, you're traveling in um, in, in in a place where uh, you know to a place where there's only 3G coverage, then you know your cell phone is going to try to find a 4G uh, network, and if it does, it's great. It's going to communicate in, in 4G, but uh, connect in 4G. But if it doesn't, then it's going to revert back to 3G and be able to communicate or, or connect with the uh, uh, with the 3G capability. This is essentially how we believe WAM is going to work. So if if a device can't use WAM, it will go back to a previous technology. But if it is going to use WAM, does that mean that the network requires upgrades as well, not just the devices? Yeah, so for WAM to work and deliver the type of benefits that uh, we do today, um, you need it on both sides. Uh, it's identical to why you know you need 4G on both the cellular antenna and in your cell phone, or you need uh, 802.11n or the new generation of Wi-Fi in both your, uh, you know, your laptop or your phone as well as your uh, router. So it really has to exist on both sides. But I think the industry has gotten used to it. It's exactly the same way that I guess the majority of standards have evolved over maybe the last 20 or 30 years. When you went from, uh, you know, 10 megabit Ethernet to uh, fast Ethernet, and then the world moved up to uh, uh, gigabit Ethernet, it uh, it was uh, it was done the same way. So uh, I think people are expecting that, and that's exactly what uh, what we've implemented. Okay, great. Yossi Cohen, co-founder of MagnaCon. Thank you very much for making the time to tell us about this today. Thank you very much, Martha. I appreciate that. Exciting times. Definitely. <laughs>